all of you. Uh, on this webinar where I'd like to give you an insight about the first time which I made a video series, which is more than 15 hours, I'd like to give an insight in this series about my vision about chess. Specifically, I was focusing on the Sicilian defense, which I was playing all my life, more than 30 years three decades with both colors, with the white pieces and with the black pieces. So I made a small package here for today that I want to share with you. You get a little bite of it, what kind of uh, ideas I have. And also I showing a lot of my memorable games. And I'm very fortunate that during the 30 years of my career, I had quite a bit of interesting entertainment uh, entertaining uh, game in my life and I'm always very happy to share it with other people I was also writing a book on it but it's always different to be here in person I hope you will remember the things I'm saying in a more vivid way when you're playing your own games so let's move on to some of the examples I wanted to show you So let's start with the, the first game I want to show you with uh, Fisher playing against Ruby Netti. And uh, in the whole series, I have all kinds of different topics. First of all, I'm talking about the different patterns, how Sicilian is built up. There are every opening has its typical ideas, typical situations where you know that your pieces have to be on b7 or rook on c8 and every opening has its spirit and this is what i'd like to give you that what is the spirit of the sicilian defense but every opening whatever you're going to learn and play you have to know the typical ideas where the pieces should be placed it's not only because it's the knowledge itself what is important, but also you're going to save a lot of time during the game. And trust me, if you get in time trouble, that's not going to be something which you would be happy about because you make more mistakes. So let's go into the game. It is Sicilian defense, knight f3, d6, d4 takes, knight d4, knight f6, knight c3, e6. This is the Scheveningen system, which is uh, which was played a lot back in uh, in the 70s, 80s, even between Kasparov and Karpov. I also have quite a few games by Kasparov in the series. Here, most of the top players did not want to play with this move order because of the Keras attack after g4. But okay, let's move on with bishop c4, which was very popular not so popular but it was uh, the reason people started to play it also and actually i was playing this system the bishop c4 system because bobby fisher was playing it and also not only playing it but being very successful in that so bishop b3 this is also what uh, i like to mention whenever i show this kind of position that the bishop on b3 is very very good and it can be very sharp on the diagonal of a to g8 i show different patterns in the video when e6 is the target and bite is sacrificing there or on the d5 square f5 square and different typical situations which happen many many times in many different games short castle of course bishop b7 here black is threatening to take the pawn on e4 but actually it's not something white would be afraid so much in all the time but white protected it with rook e1 just in case but this rook e1 is first of all protecting the pawn on e4 but it will have a completely other idea behind it as well black played knight bd7 white plays bishop g5 Bishop g5 is a healthy move. Now the queen is under a pin, so the f6 knight can't be moving. And now black played h6. It is, it can be, we can say that it's a typical reaction when white is putting the bishop on g5, 
not only in the Sicilian, but in the Nimzo Indian, in, in the Rai Lopez, in many different uh, in many different openings, then you have the bishop on g5, pin the f6, f6 knight. Many times you, you have just reflection that to push away the bishop and ask the bishop, where does it want to go? Should he keep the pin by playing bishop h4 or should he be moving back? Fisher wanted to keep the pin and played bishop h4. Of course, when we keep the bishop on h4, we are also trying to provoke the opponent to play g5, which is obviously was not the case for black. I don't even think that black considered to play g5 because it would be too dangerous for black for the king's side. Black played knight c5. And here I would like to have a little break for a few seconds, a minute, to make you think that how would white continue here? What do you have to look in such a position? What is black's plan? First of all, of course, the c5 knight is attacking the e4 pawn, but that's not the main idea because of the pin, white, black cannot be taking the pawn on e4. But what black is aiming for to get rid of this bishop on b3, because just in case, he doesn't want to get any treble. But unfortunately for black, the treble is here already. And Fisher played bishop d5. This is actually a typical pattern in this kind of Sicilian, especially when the king stays in the center. I have a separate chapter in the video series where we talk about the king in the center. Most of the time I can say that it gets into trouble. And this is why bishop d5 is possible, because after black accepted the sacrifice, e takes d5, e takes d5, now it's taken back with a check. So this is why the rook on e1 is very well placed. Right now, bishop e7 would be not possible because actually time is very important in chess too. If black would have one more move to make, obviously he would castle and laugh that he has a piece up. But actually white would be playing here knight f5. And the game is practically over because black cannot defend himself against the capture on e7. So after e takes d5, there was no other choice for black than to play king d7. Now there is a moment for white, but on the other hand, white has to be quick also, because after all, white just sacrificed the piece, and what he got in return so far is only one pawn. But white played a very good move, forcing matters immediately. B4. I also talk about in these kind of games also that you have to look the board, not only the middle of the board, the E line, for example, here, or the king side when you're giving an attack, but also on the queen side. And sometimes you have to make moves completely other end of the board to be successful in your attack. Now black has not really too much of an option because the C5 knight cannot jump too many places where it's not under attack. Actually, the only square is to go to a4. And now white continued capturing on a4. And after b takes a4, a very important move was played by Bobby, c4. And I like these moves when a move has at least two meaning or threat or idea behind it. First of all, after c4, White defended the important d5 pawn, which blocks the b7 bishop for practically for the full game. But the other important effect is that the queen on d1, without making a single move yet, already attacking, and it's part of the attack because in the next move, he will take on a4, which black cannot stop. So black, of course, in such a case, tries to look for safety for his king. But already now, after queen a4, white has two pawns for the sacrificed piece. But it's not the two pawns what really matters in this position. What matters is that practically all of white's pieces are playing 
in the attack. They take their own role. There is only one piece, the A1 rook, which is not in the play right now. Look at Black's pieces. Black didn't make a single move with the H8 rook, which most likely he's not going to play in this game. Also, the F8 bishop is very passive and not possible to make a move really with it. The F6 knight cannot be moving. So generally speaking, the B7 bishop is also, it's like a pawn practically. So here I don't think Black had too, many, too much hope to save the game, but of course, to resign, it's never too late. Let's see what Black had in mind to try to save the game or try to prolong and resist. Queen d7. In such a position, when we are attacking, there are very, very seldomly happens that we want to exchange queens. We exchange queens only when we have material advantage. Then it's on our favor. In this situation, it's clear that we have to move the queen. You can move to c2, but Bobby played queen b3. Generally speaking, I would say that in this position, this is not the only winning move. Queen c2 was just as good as queen b3. B g5, after all, black was already, couldn't do anything better than this. Bishop g3. The bishop on g3 will be very helpful once white is playing c5. Because here, the diagonal where the bishop is standing right now, it can be very unpleasant for black as well. Now black played knight h5. He wanted to get rid of this bishop. And I can fully understand the concept of black. But black would need at least two, three, four more moves to be able to recover this difficult position. Of course, black's plan is to play bishop g7 and finally to say that I developed. But now white made some action, c5. It was about time. It is very important when you're the attacker, when the opponent's king is naked over there, there is no pawns which is protecting it, you have to open the lines for your rooks because then it will be deadly dangerous for black or for the defender. Black took b d takes c5, B takes C5, now C6 is killing, so black has to capture Queen D5, white played Rook E8 check, King D7, and now Queen A4 check. Now there is no other move than Bishop C6, and after Knight C6, King E8, Rook E1, black resigned already because King D7, Knight B4, and wins the Queen. So this was an example. Uh, I like this game because it shows very well that already at the very early stage of the game, you can end up having treble or very difficult game. So after bishop d5, practically, when after black took and accepted the offer, it was already helpless. So let me show you the next game. <clears throat> which actually is also about the same theme, about the importance of the d5 square and the sacrifice there. In this game, it was played at the New York Open in 1986. I was nearly 10 years old. And I sacrificed the pawn already in this game. I have very nice memory about this tournament as it was the unrated section and eight rounds. It was four days with double rounds. So it was one game in the morning, one game in the evening, which was something very new for me at the time. And ever since I was not a big fan of uh, playing two games a day. But uh, here I had won my first seven games. And actually in this game, the draw was enough already for me to secure the first place. So in this position, uh, I made a move which actually I won some material afterwards. Maybe you can, you know my game, but I was not sharing this game in too many places yet. Uh, so what would you play in this position? Actually, what I played, it's not the only good move because in this position, the importance is that you realize it, that if there wouldn't be a pawn on E6, that would be a huge loss for black and actually the game would be over. 
And once you realize that, that that's the basic, the key defender, you understand that you have a move, you have an opportunity to deflect that pawn and actually win material. So I guess by now you get the point, what is the right move? And I played knight d5, though I have to admit bishop d5 is just as good, but the idea is the same. Now I'm threatening with knight c7, as well as with bishop c7, trapping the queen. So black doesn't have too much of a choice. If black would be taking e takes d5, then bishop d6 would be deadly for black, because if black would be trying to save himself on the e-file with playing knight e4, I would just simply go bishop e7 and bishop d5, and for black it's hopeless because he's going to lose too much material. So it's kind of a hopeless position. Black cannot take it with the pawn. So in this position, black castled, but after this, I made the very simple move, knight takes e7, queen e7, and bishop d6. So after queen d8, I took the rook, it was an exchange up, but after queen f8, what is also very important, and I give a lot of examples to the fact that when you have a winning position, you have to make sure that you're precise and play good enough moves to win the game. Because sometimes it happens with the very best players that by having a winning position, they become easy in the game. They don't take it so seriously. This will be good enough moves. And then you make yourself, you make trouble for yourself and you might not win. So in this kind of position, for example, where I have two rooks and exchange up, it is very important to open up the lines for the rook. So that's the reason I played a4, and after my opponent played bishop b7, I went a takes b5, a takes b5, and c4. It was very important to open up the lines. But to be honest, at this point, I offered a draw, which probably I wouldn't do now, but I was too excited to finish the tournament and take the first prize. So let's move on to... Uh, my selection of next game. But this was a, a very special tournament for me. In my series, I have quite a few games from this event. It was Amsterdam 89. I was 13 years old, and this was round one. But already by the end of the tournament, round seven, when I beat Hulak, which I also cover in the series, then already people knew that. I was in a very special form and I knew a lot of uh, things and I won quite a few games already. But here in round one, people were not really aware of it. So let's see the game. Okay. So now, now I see also your chat, what you're writing to me. So sometimes when I'm going to ask you about the moves, then uh, I'm going to see on my screen also what is your suggestion. But let me show you this game, which I played against Hans Ray. He's a strong grandmaster, and in 89, uh, he was still optimistic, and he really wanted to beat me. But to tell you the truth, I heard it later on that he didn't respect me so much at the time, but also I didn't have so many great results against strong opposition. Right now, it's a Scheveningen system, castle, bishop e3, a6, f4, queen c7. Queen c7 is a move which is most often played in the Sicilian, though in some lines, black is keeping uh, git on d8 at least for for a few moves and then uh, only after developing with the knight he's playing queen c7 it is important uh, mainly at this stage of the opening to put uh, defense over the e5 uh, move if i would be playing 
G4 was from my very young age one of my favorite move and to be honest I always stayed addicted to it you can find many of my games where I play G4 some of the games where it is very much spirit of the very much in the spirit of the position but there are many occasions also where I played it where it was completely unexpected and it was not a typical uh, pattern which is obvious for everybody and of course due to this because I played many times g4 or with black g5 there were some times when it was not sound and it was not the best move but still I liked very much this aggressive move already to start attacking from very early stage of the game so my opponent there are a lot of different alternatives here knight c6 that's the main move, but my opponent played rook e8. In order that he wanted to get prepared against the attack, of course, after rook e8, the main idea that when black is needing the line on the e-file, the support of the rook, black would be playing bishop f8. So, of course, if I played g4, I didn't hesitate and played g5. Knight d7, bishop h5. I see that there is a greetings from Adelaide. I had a tournament in 86 there. Nice memories also. So after bishop h5, this was an important move. As I'm threatening with knight e6, and I put pressure on the e8 rook. So black has to make a move, uh, something against it. Actually, this is a game which I'm... I'm winning, but also I show a game where I was the victim in the same line against Shirov. My opponent played g6. Of course, when someone plays g6, you have to know that it can be danger eventually on the diagonal of a1, h8. So you have to be very careful and you have to think about it that if you play g6, you better have the time to go bishop f8, bishop g7 as well just to make sure that you defend also your king. So I went bishop g4. Bishop g4 is supporting my idea either to play f5 or possibly to sacrifice on e6. My opponent was not very alert about it and instead of playing bishop f8 and defending the e6 pawn, he just simply played pretty fast knight c6 which was already a blunder. He was extremely careless. And here suddenly I realized that I have an opportunity to sacrifice a piece. So I got very enthusiastic about it. And after not long thinking, I just chopped on E6. But this is also a typical idea. This is not the only game. There are hundreds and thousands of games which you, which you can look in the database but generally speaking i also like to tell you that how did i learn openings the way i learned openings we had a cartotech system which had tens of thousands of games on a specific opening so whenever i wanted to develop and uh, learn a new opening then i took from this system uh, a bunch of games mostly from good players and then started to look over the games one after another. And then I started to learn little by little how the big guys, the experts are playing that specific opening. And then slowly you understand all the small details and you understand, for example, if you see in every game that they are playing, they put the queen on c7, then you understand it will be very obvious that you have to put the queen on c7 because that's the that's how this opening is built up that simply that supports the most your structure so let's get back to knight e6 of course black has to take it and then i played bishop e6 check now already black has a difficult situation because he has to choose out of three bad options <laughs> he cannot go king f8 because i would go f5 and then this g6 is already a trouble because in the next move, I will be able to open up the f5, which would be deadly for black. 
So black plate king h8. Now already you see how difficult will be for black because of the move g6. So this is why I forced g6 when I played bishop h5, even losing a tempo. So now obviously my next move is before I go to the long diagonal, I was going to play knight d5. Ask the queen, where does it want to go? Because it doesn't really have a good place. Black played queen b8. It is a sad story for black because on b8, the queen will not really support the king on h8. And of course, now I played bishop f7. Actually, bishop d4 was just not maybe not as good but almost just as good as bishop f7 so i played bishop f7 because i calculated all the way how i'm going to win the game black played rook f8 rook d8 wouldn't help much on black because anyway i would be taking on e7 and after knight e7 i would be giving the check black has no other move than knight e5 i would take f takes e and after f takes e you know how I follow up. I just take it on e5, takes, and queen d8. Exactly. I completely agree that you wouldn't like to play it with black. Neither of us, I guess. But from white, it's a lot of fun. The so black played rook f8. I played bishop d4. Black played knight e5 because there is not much of a choice for black. Knight e7. And after knight e7, f takes e5 f takes e5 and now it's important of course the position is is winning but still i always like to pull your attention that make the right move if you can win the game within three moves win and be precise because sometimes you're going to waste your energy maybe you're going to win the game in any way but if you play in a tournament you need your energy so try to save it and in such a position really win it with within few moves I played bishop c5, and if black would be playing queen c7, then after queen d6, black can resign because of all the possible pin what we have. Black played king g7, I went bishop e7. Now if rook f7 would be played, then king g8, I would give check on d8. And after rook f8, you have a choice to take rook f8, queen f8 and bishop e5, or if if you want to play queen d5, rook f7, bishop e7, it also wins material immediately. So it's already a matter of choice. But the black played king g7, bishop e7, queen a7, check first, and after king h1, bishop h3, just a try, but after queen f3, there was no more try and my opponent resigned. After the game, he was very surprised that actually it was not even a battle in this game because when I sacrificed the knight on e6 it was clear that it's very dangerous and after a few moves I'm sure my opponent understood that this game will be won by the white pieces okay so I want to move on to some other example my next example will be that I played against Milos, who was for a long time the best Brazilian player. And I want to show you this game because I talk a lot generally in the, well, as we checked the Fisher game, it was also king was in the center. And uh, to, to have the king in the center, it's like 99%, you don't want to have that because you only can get treble. But there are exceptions when actually the king is standing best in the center because somehow that's the way the king can help the most in the attack. And this is what happened in this game. I had a match in Sao Paulo in 1996, long time ago. I was 20 years old at the time. And I had a four game rapid match against uh, Milos Gilberto. So I was playing with the black pieces and I played the Nidorf, but we entered into the Scheveningen system. F4, I talk about uh, in the DVD, in the video series also about G4, the way I beat Anand. If you're going to have time, probably I will show you that game also because it's one of the best game I've ever played. 
also F3 is another move, which is uh, of course considered uh, very serious, that's the English attack. But here my opponent played F4. B5, Queen F3. This is very typical. I myself also liked very much to set up the pieces like this, to be ready for the attack, pawn on f4, queen on f3, and after bishop b7, bishop on d3. This is a very typical setup. And after this, white still has an option to castle short or castle long. I say greetings from Brazil. I love Brazil, so I would be happy to go back again. <laughs> And after bishop d3, black plays knight d7. This is also typical that when you have your bishop on b7, knight on f6, you try to have your other knight on c5, put pressure on the e4 pawn, and also trying to get rid of the famous d3 bishop. Hello, Indonesia. I was also there. It was great. Romania. <laughs> Fantastic. I had won my first boys on the 12th uh, championship in Romania. Uh, hold on, you want to flip board. So does everybody like that, being the winner side? <laughs> okay, for this game, I leave it the uh, flip board. So knight c5 is something that uh, uh, is advised because the e4 pawn is uh, is under attack. So g4, I wouldn't play probably differently than my opponent if I would be the white pieces. <clears throat> h6, h6 is is practically a typical reply. First of all, I don't want to allow white to play g5. But the other thing is that. I'm the g5 player, so sometimes I want to play g5 myself in order to deflect the f4 pawn. And I talk pretty much in the, in the video series also about the importance of the e5 square. Probably some of you might know my game against Shiro, which I played in Buenos Aires. And uh, it is pretty known and there it is one of the greatest example i show where i played g5 and i made other funny interesting creative moves but the main thing is that the knight on e5 it has real power sometimes less sometimes more sometimes more and sometimes like a magic here so far i played h6 white played a3 a3 you play against b4 that I, I don't have b4 because otherwise it would be also nice for black to play b4 sometimes to push away the c3 knight from defending the e4 pawn. Rook c8. This is also something uh, I, I have different examples in the series that I want to show the importance that this is, for example, when the queen stays in d8. What's the reason that I didn't put my queen on c7? The reason is that in this position, for example, if it would be my move with black again, which is not, I would sacrifice my rook on c3, destroy the pawn structure on the queen side, and after that to go knight c5. The, the positional sacrifices it also goes in every opening, but generally speaking, also in the sharpest lines of the Sicilian, for example, in the dragon, but also in positions like here in the Scheveningen system, it is very common that if you play with the white pieces, you want to avoid it because it's definitely not fun when somebody is sacrificing the rook on c3 and after knight c5, if you're losing the e4 pawn, then definitely I can imagine only very few occasions where it's not enough, it's not great for black. So my opponent played castle. After castle, I don't have enough time necessarily to take on c3, though I was considering it very seriously. But it's a problem sometimes when you have a choice of few good moves and then you have to uh, this side. And this was of our match, the fourth game. And this was a game which would decide the game because it was one and a half, one and a half. 
And uh, so I was also kind of looking for safety as well. For the moment, I consider that Bishop e7 is good to develop my piece because the c3 knight will not run away and I will have later on also the option to play rook c3, but I had also other plans like g5. Rook ae1. White was just simply continuing his development. Though I'm not sure that g4 was needed so much, because I believe that if you want to play with your pieces to castle short, to play rook to e1, then maybe combining it with g4, you have to be careful and you have to analyze it and think about it, whether you really have the time for it. So now already I played g5. I was very happy with it because right now my bishop is very strong and it's the because of the white queen, white cannot go anything like e5. And uh, I thought that the king on g1 short castle was not the right choice for white. White played f5. This is also a very typical reply after g5 in order to put pressure on the e6 pawn. I played knight e5. It is very important that knight to e5, it comes with a tempo attacking the queen. White goes to h3. But right now, what I have to think about that the e6 pawn is attacked, but it's not only that. White played queen h3 in order to have a pin, and white would want to take also bishop g5 possibly. So now I would ask you to think about the position. What do you think? How can I uh, make a move that actually I defend both threats of white? So I leave you to think about it for a minute or two, because when I found this move during the game, I was extremely satisfied and I knew and understand that white will probably not be able to uh, save the game even. Knight fg4 is possible, but uh, once I found the move which I played, I was not even calculating longer whether knight g4 is good or not. Because knight g4 is a threat anyway. Queen b6 would be a mistake because uh, it, the e3 bishop is very strong and the knight on d4 could be jumping. But... Uh, there is one good player, really good player in the audience who found already, or maybe I can say who is the fastest solving this problem. And exactly, I played king d7. So bishop g5 is not possible. <clears throat> but at this point, I defended my rook with my king. It is crazy, isn't it? <laughs> And uh, when I found this move, I understood that my king is safe. I protected the e6 pawn. The g4 pawn is under attack. But not only that, but also h5 might be coming. And of course, I shouldn't be forgetting about the powerful rook c3, just in case eventually. So white didn't have really much of a choice. He had to defend his pawn on g4. Is king d7 a woman move? Well, if women are also playing very well at chess, then we can say yes. <laughs> so now I could do rook c3, but again I had the question and uh, to decide how to continue the game. But h5 was something I knew 100% that it was good and I didn't really have to calculate anything because after fe6, fe6, the g4 is under attack so white definitely has to react on my h5. He took. And I played g4. Again, protecting my e6 pawn. White has to move away. Queen g2. I played now rook c3. 
So finally, all different kind of ideas was played in the game. First of all, my king was in the center, but actually it served very well in the center. I broke the g4 uh, pawn for white by playing h5. And now the most important thing is that the e4 pawn will be disappeared after bc, bishop e4. And it's not only about the e4 pawn, but the powerful bishop on the long diagonal, which will make the game uh, win for black. Queen f2, knight h5. Of course, when you see a rook on h8, the bishop on e4, and the king on g1, immediately you can associate in your brain that sometime rook h1 can happen as a mate. White was trying to save or fight a little bit longer, but of course he understood that there is not much of a chance to save the game. g3. It is important when we are attacking to get rid of our pawns front of us, front of the rook, open up the lines for the rook to be able to play and give mate possibly. hg, knight f4, queen f4, I gave check on h1, king f2, rook h2, king e3, bishop g5, and in few moves my opponent resigned. So this, I like this example because uh, it shows that the king can be also very powerful if uh, the position is not open, but it can really support the attack in a very special way. Let's go on to another example. And this example will be, uh, I take back the white pieces because I was playing with white. In the Sicilian also, uh, there are a lot of different end games. And in end games, I discuss about good knight against bad bishop, uh, all kind of different setups, how the bad bishop can uh, come alive and actually improve itself, or the same color bishop. But also, I talk about a different color bishop. And I pick now this uh, example because when I was a child, it was not so obvious for me that when it's a different color bishop with equal material with rooks, then it can be a huge advantage to one or to another side. Without the rooks is most of the time, at least 80%, even if you have one or two pawns down, there are many occasions where it's a draw. But contrary, when you have the rooks with a different color bishop, that's a completely different story. And this is one of the game where I can show and demonstrate how much it's true. In this position, the bishop on d5 is much more powerful than the bishop on d2. But why? Because of the situation of the difference between the two king. Practically, this is the main difference. It's true that white is active because my rook is on the seventh rank, which is very important generally. So whenever you have the chance to put your rook, if you're white, to the seventh rank or to put on the second rank if you play with black, that's a huge achievement and it gives uh, a lot of uh, difficulty for your opponent. So your opponent definitely will be very nervous and probably is completely right about it. But in this position, specifically, the big danger for black is his king, that it's actually trapped in the corner, while my king can be moving and improve the position. So that's what I did, and I played king g2. This game I played in aix les bains in France in 2011 against one of the best French player, Edouard Roman. And... Uh, my opponent thought that it's going to be a little bit difficult, but his mo last move was rook d8, and his plan was to play h6. But I thought that if he's going to play h6, he's going to be in big trouble. But if he's not going to play h6, then for the moment, I'm just going to improve my king position. So my plan would be to bring my king all the way up to g4 and possibly to play h5. But to defend such a position, it is very difficult. You have, you have to have a lot of patience, and also you have to pay attention very much to every move. 
So even if it's a draw, it is very difficult in practical game to save it. Because if white has the patience, and let's say I would go with my king to uh, all the way, well, I can also go to the king si queen side, I go back and forth. This is what Karpov was always a specialist, that if he has a little advantage, he would go all the around the queen side, nothing there, then he would come back, he would be maneuvering here and there. And when the opponent is very tired and has a time trouble, then he would do some action, probably then king g4 and h5, and give extra difficulty for the opponent. But actually, my opponent did not wait until this point, but played h6, which is actually a huge mistake. It is a blunder. I would leave you for like a half a minute or a minute. Some of you probably would play uh, the right move instantly, and probably most of you would play the right move only after some time of thinking. Yes, h5. h5 is the move. And actually, this happens in my life. I had a few games where I was able to play this kind of breakthrough. When I was a kid also, this was one of the favorite breakthrough where there is four pawns opposing to each other, two black and two white. And actually, there are all kinds of different examples in the Sicilian when the pawns go in pairs. Here you see that my pawns are on g5 and h5. In middle game, it's more on e5 and f5 with the white pawns, or with black, it's e5 and d5. But there are a lot of different occasions where you see two pawns next to each other having a great effect and great power. And now practically black had to, he was playing on, but he could have resigned as well because he has no saving move. If he would take g takes h5, I would simply go g6, and the rook h7 mate is not defendable, because after king j8, I would go rook h7, king f8, and g7, and queen my pawn. My opponent went rook g8. I played rook d7, attacking two at the same time, the rook and the d6 pawn. Black had to keep the protection over the g6 pawn, so he played rook g7. And now I played, my move was not the only winning move, but it was the most precise one. So when I saw this move, I knew exactly that I'm not going to calculate all kind of checks and takes the pawn, but I played the powerful bishop f7. This is again a typical uh, situation where after this move, I knew that the game will be over within two moves. Contrary, if I would have taken other route to winning, then probably it, we could have played another 20 moves. Black played bishop g5. If black would take now g takes h5, then I would give a check g6, and I would even play rook d6 and win the bishop as well. But black played in this position, bishop g5. I took h takes g6. There is no concrete mate, but I will play rook b7 and rook b8. So my opponent resigned here. So let me show you one more game. And that will be my game against Anand from Dos Hermanas. Because this was one of the best games I've ever played, and I have great memories from this game. This was also a Nidorf. I played bishop e3 for the first time in 1996, and ever since uh, up to my retirement, I was a big favor on this move. And after e6, there are different ideas which we discussed, and I played the g4 the most sharp line here in this system. e5 was played by an and there are other options like h6 for example 
but this is the fourth concrete line, knight f5, because otherwise the g4 pawn would be under attack and black would capture it. g6, now I cannot move my, with my knight because the g4 pawn would be not protected. g5, gf5, and now gf6 would be not good because simply black would capture the pawn but ef5 this is all theory black plays d5 because he wouldn't want to go away with the knight for example anywhere because the d5 square is more important so black played instead of knight g8 he went d5 so counterattack is always very important there are many games where i show that First of all, you have to know that when they attack one of your pieces, don't take it for granted that you have to move away with it. Sometimes you have counter chances, counter attack, intermediate move, and it can actually change the evaluation of the whole game. Queen F3, for the moment, I protect my pawn on F5 and don't take the knight on F6 because sometimes pressure is more frightening than if I execute and take the knight. After queen f3, black played d4, long castle. By playing long castle for the temporary, I defended both of my pieces, the bishop on e3 and the knight on c3 because the queen would be under attack. So now black has to play knight d7. And now I won a very beautiful game against Kasim Janov by playing bishop d4, but in this game I played bishop d2. And this game was in 1999, while the bishop d4 game was six years later in the World Championship where I played in Argentina. After bishop d2, it's obvious that black will be taking the offered knight, bishop c3. Now black has to think how to develop and what is the route for his king to get some safe shelter and black played vichy decided to play bishop g7 trying to castle after bishop g7 i still don't want to capture the knight because somehow i think i'm able to capture it anytime i want so i played rook g1 rook g1 is kind of a prophylactic move i'm preparing against castling but here castle was not a good choice by an end. Actually here also we can say that king is not safe really on e8. He has to be expecting dangers from different sides, especially if I would be bringing my bishop to c4 later on. But still it is safer than after castling. Black should have played queen c7 for the moment. And if I would be taking now, then after bishop f6, black's king is quite okay. I have compensation, but it's still a very complicated game. Black played, instead of queen c7, short castle, which after I already took g takes f6, queen f6. Now the question was how to improve my position. So far, I have great pieces. The rook on g1 is attacking, the bishop on c3 stands excellent, but somehow I should be able to put my f pawn to f4. So in order to do so, I played queen e3. <clears throat> For the moment, black cannot move his knight on the, from d7 because I put pressure over the e5 pawn. Black played king h8, which is a very logical move because he wants to get out from the pin on the g file and also he wants to threat with bishop h6 i played f4 of course i want to put as much pressure as i can on the long diagonal because after all i have a piece down so i have to be fast also if let's say the rook from a8 could be jumping to e8 then it would be a completely different story now black reacted not in the best way and black's best move was to play rook e8 and protect over the e5 square 
And after that, I would be going probably bishop c4. I have full compensation, but it's not an easy game for sure. The black played queen b6. It was forcing me to play the right move, queen g3, because obviously in such a position with material down, I don't want to exchange queens unless I have something very, very concrete and I gain back material. If black would be playing rook g8, then bishop c4 would be very strong. And I would be attacking the f7 pawn here. So black after queen g3 had to play queen h6. There was no other option. Right now it's defending the me. I cannot play, I cannot take on e5 because of the pin on the diagonal. So I played a very aggressive move because there was a very concrete idea. I felt it's very important to force the next move by black. I played rook d6. This was a very important move. First of all, my rook becomes more active and I force black to play f6. Because if black would be playing knight f6 and trying to develop and open the diagonal for the c8 bishop, then I would be playing bishop e5, and after bishop f5, I would be already sacrificing material, bishop f6, queen f6, rook f6, and I have a pawn up. Still, it's not so easy to win, though, but uh, white is clearly uh, having a pawn up, and it's a huge advantage. So black could not play knight f6. <coughs> And interesting that, for example, after bishop f6, the best move would be a quiet move, which also pretty often happens that no matter how tactical the position, sometimes a quiet move really gives the final touch to the game. After king b1, I would free my f4 pawn to be able to join the action on e5, and practically black cannot make any move here. After f, e, f4, I would go rook f6, knight f6, and queen f4, and black will have to resign because rook d8, just trying to save the game, but bishop d3 is the easiest, and it's over. So instead of bishop f6, black's only move was to play f6. Now with my next move, <clears throat> It was very difficult for black to continue and find a defense. Bishop d2. Bishop d2 was, I think, also unexpected by Anand. Because actually, f e5 is really... A, if I could play f6 e5, then the game was more or less over. But there is one fantastic saving idea for black, which actually none of us saw all the way. Black played e4 without thinking too much, but there was a, a defense. It's kind of a miracle, I think. Knight c5, and after f takes e4, what would you suggest for black to try to save the game? <clears throat> there is an amazing move by black. Knight e4. The black king is queen is hanging, but for the moment I cannot take it because of my queen, king on c1. So after bishop h6, black would be taking bishop h6 check, and only after that he would be taking my queen. So I cannot take on bishop h6, but I have an amazing move, which is, I think, one of the most unbelievable moves which I've seen and it's e takes f6. Actually, if you see, my queen is hanging, my rook is hanging, my bishop is under attack. At the same time, the black queen is also under attack, but I'm playing e takes f6, which I think is a, an incredible move, and the line would be going the following. After black would be taking the queen, I would be not taking the queen, of course, but I would take g takes, f takes g7.
and after queen g7, rook g3, where black has to sacrifice the queen back because bishop c3 would be coming. Bishop c3 with deadly mating attack, but black would be taking queen g3, g h g, but the king is still very vulnerable, so black has to think about some safety. He would play probably h5, bishop h6, bishop f5, giving back the exchange, and there is quite reasonable chances to save the game for black. But when I first uh, found out that e takes f6 in this position possible, I was really amazed uh, by this opportunity. So knight c5 was actually not saving the game, but I think it was the best choice to make. Black played e4, avoiding the f4 pawn to be able to capture on e5. After this, I realized that I have to improve my position. It's very clear that the h6 queen has no space and no possibilities to move away because it's protecting the black bishop. But there is one more piece of mine which is not really playing. So it was time to bring it into play. I played bishop c4. The bishop on c4 gives extra importance in this position because it covers the diagonal and whenever, if possible, the bishop would be moving, then queen g8 would be giving a checkmate. So right now it was very difficult for black to try to save the game. If black would try to get out from the box by playing knight c5, then I would be playing bishop e3, immediately attack it, and if black would be playing b6 because somehow he has to defend his knight, I would just simply take the pawn, and after knight b7, I would be playing rook c6 and go for the seventh rank, or bishop d5, and after rook b8, bishop d4, and on f6, I will be sacrificing shortly. So it wouldn't save black to play knight c5. But black played b5, trying to be a little active. Now I played bishop e6, attacking the knight on d7. Now knight c5 wouldn't help much, because I would anyway play bishop e3, forcing matters, and after knight e6, f e6, I would be threatening with f5, very strong move, so black has to go queen g6, where I would just simply go queen h3, and after the queen moves back, I would be going f5. So this is something black cannot survive. So if we go back, here knight c5 was also not a move to save the game. Black played rook a7. It had its logic because on the seventh rank, possibly it could give extra defense for black. I played an important move because the c7 square here, I felt that it can be very important defensive square for black. I played rook c6, not to allow black to go to c7 with the rook. Now black played a5, he was trying to get some space. I played bishop e3 attacking the rook on a7. Rook b7. And now I improved my position by playing bishop d5. Now rook c8 is threatening, so the black rook had to be moving. Move to b8. And now, as I always say, it is so important to get to the seventh rank with the rook. So that's what I did. I played rook c7. Not only the important part that it's attacking so the knight cannot move, but also I control the b7 square, and also bishop a7, for example, is a great threat. <clears throat> and actually, we can say that black is in Tsukzwang, practically, because he cannot make a move with any of his pieces. He played b4. This was kind of a critical situation, because I knew that this game has to be won by me if I play the right move. But at this point, I 
not only wanted to make the good move, but I was also trying to make the best move for the moment psychologically. And my next move was that kind of move that I felt after I played B3, the quiet move, somehow I felt that Anand gave up here. And later on, I was talking with his uh, second, Ubilava, and he also told me that, well, after you played B3, it was really over. So sometimes not necessarily only concrete executions could work and make scoring a point, but sometimes small, quiet moves can be really irritating to the opponent. And after this, if black would be playing rook d8, I would be going bishop c6, and now it's a full tsuk swan position, even though we have most of the pieces on the board. You cannot play with the b8 rook, not with the c8 bishop because the d7 knight is hanging, the d7 knight cannot move because the g7 bishop is hanging, the d8 rook cannot move because the d7 is hanging, the queen is protecting the bishop, so practically the game is over for black. Black played rook b5, trying to look for some counter chances, but now already I played the concrete bishop c6, and after rook f5, a small combination, because I felt that this is the easiest way to win the game, and I played rook c8, rook c8, bishop d7, rook c c5 because both rooks were hanging so one has to defend the other one and if the other rook would be going then f5s would be immediately winning so after rook c5 bishop f5 rook f5 and i simply played rook d1 this is also important that sometimes when you have a great attack and your pieces did its duty sometimes you have to regroup them because somewhere else they serve better and after rook d1 black cannot defend against rook d8 but black was trying to escape with king g8 trying to get out to f7 and after queen g2 an end resigned as the e4 pawn is not possible to defend and he understood that there is no doesn't make any sense to play on this game so i hope you enjoyed it uh, this little webinar. I'm happy that you joined me and uh, I suggest you that if you liked it then you would be enjoying probably my video series which is more than 15 hours. Today for another more than 24 hours we have a special discount but uh, I would like to uh, and I was making a lot of effort to make you understand more and more about the Sicilian. Hold on, I bring back the screen. So uh, I was paying more attention uh, to show you details, but also not only about the Sicilian in the, in the series, but also to make you understand for amateurs how difficult and complex can be a full game but also it means that you always have chances you should never give up have your fighting spirit always high and keep your passion about chess thanks for joining me and have a nice day